All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be our first lesson in our new unit. So this is unit five. Unit five is an incredibly long unit, and we're going to do the first half of unit five before winter break, and then we'll finish up the second half of unit five after winter break. So in our first half of unit five, we're really going to be looking at the political revolutions. When I say political revolutions, I'm talking about things like the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Latin American Revolution, and the revolutions of 1848. But we, before we get into all of that fighting, we need to think about why this fighting occurred. That is what we're going to look at in the Enlightenment today. So whenever you go to war, whenever you have a revolution, you have to have justifications for it. You have to have reasons for why you are fighting. Otherwise, it's just random chaotic violence. The Enlightenment is going to give us examples of those justifications. So we're going to see many great thinkers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Immanuel Kant, and we are going to at least get into the very basics of their thinking. Obviously, all of these guys are authors and academics or were authors and academics, and they have many, many writings. And you know, we could spend one entire class just on John Locke. We could spend the entire year on Locke or Kant or Rousseau. Um, but today we're just going over the uh, kind of the brief uh brief summary or brief introduction to their ideas. Now one I one question or one thought I at least want to bring up is this idea of strong government versus weak government. And when I say strong and weak, I don't mean those subjectively. Oftentimes we associate strong as a good thing and weak as a bad thing, but I'm not saying that. I'm saying strong as one type of government and weak as a different type of government. A strong government is kind of the governments that we've seen throughout world history so far. These are governments who have a lot of power and a lot of control and collect a lot of taxes and, you know, have exercise, you know, exercise, exercise their power over the people. Think, you know, the Song Dynasty or the Abbasid Caliphate or anything from unit one and three. We talked about how all of these societies centralize their power. But now going forth, we'll see weak governments. Weak governments are governments that don't have as much power. They don't have as many taxes. They're not as strong. They don't have as many rules and regulations. And that might sound bad, but what a weak government means, or at least it's supposed to mean in, in theory, is that you have a stronger, stronger population. So if the government is very weak, then the people have more strength. The people like you and me who are not working for the government, not in the government bureaucracy, hopefully would have more freedom and fewer taxes. And we would be able to use our own ingenuity in order to push society forward instead of relying on the government. So we'll see many challenges to these strong governments with the Enlightenment. Um, and so keep in, in mind which one is preferable to you. Would you rather have this strong government that takes care of things but may uh, you know, raise your taxes and limit your freedom or a weaker government that maybe isn't able to take care of everything, but allows you to have a little more freedom and fewer taxes. Ultimately, you have to make that decision once you become 18 and start voting because you will be voting against a strong versus a weaker government. Let's go ahead and look at our essential questions here. So we're just going to focus on the first two. I'm not even going to list the number three and four yet. Number one is what are the causes and effects of the political and social revolutions during this time period? We're really looking at the causes in this lecture. What caused these political revolutions to occur? Especially we're stepping into the mind. What are the motivations? What are the justifications behind these revolutions? We're not really looking at so much what was the military reason for this or the more practical reason for these revolutions. Number two is why did nationalism begin to rise and what were the positive and negative effects of this new way of organizing societies. We're going to see that in the Enlightenment causes people to think about the way in which they organize a society. Eventually, we're going to see that many of these Enlightenment philosophers promote nationalism. So throughout this unit, we'll talk about what nationalism is and what are the good things and bad things about nationalism. Now, by the end of this lecture, or at least during our synchronous learning session, you'll need to use a primary source in order to create a 
claim and support it with evidence. We still need to get that right in practice. We still need to get practice with using documents. Let's go ahead and begin. Let's start with what the Enlightenment is. So the Enlightenment is a European movement, and this is very much European. So I'm not going to really be talking about any Asian thinkers or African thinkers or American thinkers. I'm really going to be focused on Europe. Uh, from 1600 to 1800, that sought to remake society by emphasizing reason over tradition. So think about the ways in which society was organized in Europe. You had a king, right? That king had a whole lot of power. We went over that in unit three, and that king pretty much ruled over a few nobles, and then 90% of the population were really poor serfs. And the reason the king had that rule, had that power, was because that's the way it always was. That was just a traditional way to rule. And because God was the one who told the king that he would be able to rule. On top of that, most serfs were not educated. And there was this common belief that the king was king because he was smarter than everyone else. And why was he smarter than everyone else? Well, he was just born smarter than everyone else. I mean, he was chosen by God to be king, so God was going to make him more intelligent than all of the other serfs. These Enlightenment thinkers switch that. They completely flip it around and they start to promote individualism. That's not the king who's important, but the individual like you and me who are important. Freedom. We shouldn't be controlled by a king in order to protect our society. We should have the freedom to do whatever it is that we want to do. And self-determination. We should be able to determine what kind of society do we want to live in. Do we want a king? And if we want a king, what kind of king do we want to have? We should be the ones to determine that. Now, we in the United States, we're used to freedom and individualism and self-determination, and we're so used to it that we don't even really think anything of it. It's important to remember that these qualities, these uh, characteristics of society weren't always present. And in fact, throughout our study of world history, we've seen a lack of individualism, a lack of freedom and a lack of self-determination, especially when we looked at the governments in units one and three. Now, why now? What's going on during this time period or prior to this time period that causes the enlightenment to occur? Well, you have to think about the scientific, revo uh, scientific revolution and the humanism movement of the Renaissance. The humanism movement of the Renaissance stress the individual over the collective. Instead of worrying about every single person in society, let's worry about the individual. Is the individual free? Is the individual happy? Does the individual get to make their own meaning in their life? But on top of that, you have the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution said that all things can be figured out through reason, through thinking about it. It was through mathematics that we were able to discover that the earth revolves around the sun as opposed to the other way around. What if we took that scientific process, the idea of using reason and applied it to government? We could reason through what the best type of government is. And this idea is that we could use reason, use science in order to make life better for everyone, which you know is a big idea that we still have today as well. Let's go ahead and move on. Oh, quickly here just because I, these are words that I use. If I say the nature of man or the state of nature, it's just what people are like without government. So if I were to ask you, hey, what is the state of nature? What is life like for people if there was absolutely no government? That's um, the terminology I'll use there. So make sure you just keep those in mind. We're going to go ahead and talk about our first Enlightenment thinker, Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, Machiavelli was born in Italy in 1469, and his most famous work is The Prince. Now, in The Prince, he said that all people are selfish and greedy, and that that's the nature of man. All men, women, children, everyone is absolutely evil. And the only reason they're not evil is if someone forces them to be good. This leads us to this question, what type of mon uh, what type of government should we have? A monarchy, of course, because if we had a democracy or a republic where the people get to make their own decision, well, that would be chaotic. Everyone is so selfish and greedy and evil that we would never have a society. So we need to have a strong monarchy, an authoritarian strongman to put everyone in line and put everyone in order. We actually see this in our society, not necessarily the United States, but our global society today. Not that there's an introduction of kings and queens, but that there are authoritarian strong 
wrong then. People are so worried about the chaos of society. People are so worried about their neighbors being selfish and greedy and evil and riots and all of that, that they're willing to give all their power to a monarch to an authoritarian strongman in order to have more security. And Niccolo Machiavelli said, yeah, that's a good thing. We want to have a secure society because the purpose of government is to protect our nation, both from outside invaders and from within our internal enemies. Our next thinker was is Thomas Hobbes. Now, Thomas Hobbes was born in 1588, which by the time he was writing his book, The Leviathan, would have put him in the middle of the English Civil War. So he is seeing all this chaos, all of this fighting that's going on um, or, or surrounding the throne. We talked about the English Civil War very, very briefly, briefly, but just know that there's a war going on as Thomas Hobbes is writing this. Now, he believes that all people are evil and that ultimately life is nasty, brutish, and short, that we just fight against one another all, all, all the time. He believes in a monarchy. We need to have a monarchy in order to keep us out of the state of nature, in order to prevent us from fighting all of the time and keep the peace. However, one major difference that we need to note here is that Hobbes believes that the legitimacy of the ruler comes not from God, but from the people. It comes not from above, but below. And that, that is the terminology I'll be using throughout this lecture. Above is God, above is religion, below is the people. He believes that the people should be able to choose who their monarch is. This is incredibly different than what was going on in Europe and incredibly important for us. This is the first time that someone has said, hey, the people should be the ones to get the decision, not some sort of God up there who's saying that this person gets to be king. This, as you can probably start to see, is the beginning of us here in the United States having the power to elect our own president. The fact that the president does not get his power from the fact that God gave it to him, but he gets it from below. The reason he's legitimately the president, he or she is legitimately president, is because the people chose that person to be president. That's a very important part of Hobbes's um, philosophy here. And as we go on, we'll see more and more um, of the Enlightenment philosophers saying or justifying that people should be able to make the decision and that legitimacy in government should not come from above, but from below. Now, our next thinker is a big one for the United States, John Locke. John Locke wrote the two treatises of government in 1690. And as you can see right here, he says that governments are supposed to protect life, liberty, and property. That sounds a lot like what's in the United States founding documents of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as seen in the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and plagiarized Locke. He didn't cite a source or anything like that, but he used life, liberty, and that went, huh, I can't just use property because Locke already used that, and so just use pursuit of happiness. So clearly Locke is incredibly important. What is Locke saying? Well, Locke is pointing out that most people are peaceful. They could be violent, but most people are peaceful. He also believes in this idea of tabula rasa, which literally translates to blank slate. Now, in order to understand tabula rasa, let's take a step back. As I said previous uh, in this lecture, previously in this lecture, there was this idea that the king was really, really smart because God made him really smart. And all the serfs were really, really dumb because God made him really, really dumb. Locke says, no, 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 no. That's not how all this works. Everyone's a blank slate. Everyone is tabula rasa. And it is the education that uh, allows people to be smart. So if we took a serf and we gave him good education, well, he could be just as powerful as a king or just as intelligent as a king. It's not, you know, everyone is born equal is his, is, is his idea there. And so he says, well, through education, we can teach people how to run their own society, because that was the big fear of allowing people to run their own society. You can't just let these people, let these serfs run their own society. They'll, they'll mess everything up. They have no idea what's going on. They can't even read and write. So you got to give the power to the king. Locke says, no, none of that, because the people can learn. 
The people can rule over themselves. And that's a huge idea. And I know it's something we take for granted today, but it's something that is huge during this time period and obviously has long-term consequences. Now, he says the purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. Let's take a step back here. Machiavelli says protect. The government must protect the nation. Same with Thomas Hobbes. Protect the nation. Establish laws. Establish rule and order. Keep the peace. Locke says, no, no, no. The government's job isn't to protect the people from outside outside sources. Uh, the, the government's job is to protect the rights that people have. It's not meant to control the people. It is meant to free the people. So protect people's life, liberty, and property. Protect the rights that you have just because you are a human being. You naturally have those rights. And when you get into AP government in a couple of years, you'll discuss more and more with all of these philosophers as well. Let's jump to our next philosopher, which is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau believes in this idea of a social contract, just like Hobbes did, just like um, Locke did as well. But Rousseau takes it even a bit further. He says the best type of government is a direct democracy. Every single person should be able to vote. There shouldn't be a uh, a king. There shouldn't be someone else who's, who's there or like a president. It should just be everyone comes together and votes and whatever the majority wants, that's what this society goes with. So it's the general will of the population. The government is there to allow people the people to make the laws, not for the government to make laws for the people, but to allow the people to make laws for themselves. Um, one thing I do want to point out, because I'm not sure how familiar we are, we are with the different types of government, is that there's a big difference between a direct democracy and a republic. Now, in a direct democracy, every single person is going to vote. And you know, we tally up the votes, we find a majority, and then boom, we're done. With a republic, every single person votes for a person to represent them. So, for example, here in the United States, I vote for someone to represent me in the House of Representatives in um, uh, in Washington, D.C. During this time period, um, you know, the election is going on right now, so the election results are, are not in yet. But for this part of Nevada, it's either Susie Lee or Dan Rodimer. So we've we, as in not you, but people above the age of 18, we voted for someone to represent us in Congress. And that person is going to read through the laws. They're going to be the ones to study all that. And they're going to be the ones to vote for us. So they represent us. A republic, in a way, allows people to vote but still places a lot of the power in these representatives. And in case you're unsure, there are 435 representatives in the House of Representatives and 100 senators. So there are many, many representatives for the whole of the United States of America. But the whole point of that was just to show you the difference between direct democracy and republic. Our next person is Baron de Montesquieu, coming out of France. Now, all that we really need to know about Montesquieu is he came up with the separation of powers. This idea of the separation of powers um, separated the executive branch, so the president, from the legislative branch, the Congress, from the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, with the idea being that if you separate all three of these, then you will not have tyranny because those three different branches will all check one another to make sure the other one doesn't become too powerful. This is an incredibly important part of the United States governmental system and of many governmental systems after the uh, creation of the United States of America. You'll discuss this more in U.S. history and then in AP Gov as well. A couple others I want to talk about very, very quickly. The first one is Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant also believed that a um, representative government or a republic government would be the best way to organize a society. And here's why. And it, this is actually part of the reason I love Immanuel Kant's thinking. He said that the nature of man is immature because of religious authority and government governmental authority. What he said is all of these people, these serfs, 90% of the population have just been told what to do either by the church or by the king. And because they're always told what to do, they've never been able to think for themselves. And because they don't think for themselves, 
we don't have that great of a society. We just have a bunch of dumb people flounder, floundering around through life trying to do their best. And we should actually make them more mature. Think about the way in which a parent may treat their child. If the parent does every little thing for the child, the child's going to be immature because they've never done anything for themselves. Kant says, we should allow people to do things for themselves. We should allow them to make their own decisions because if we allow them to do so, they'll actually have to become smarter. They'll actually have to learn how to read and write. They'll actually have to think about uh, all, the, uh, all the aspects of a nation and what type of person would be the best leader for that nation. And that will make them more mature. And if they're more mature, they're going to be more responsible. If they're more responsible, they're going to be a better citizen. And if we have a bunch of better citizens, then we have a better society. He still said that the purpose of the government is to promote the general will of the people, not protect the people, not make a bunch of laws in order to control the people, but allow the people to have their, have their will, have their way, be able to vote on what it is that they want to vote upon. Our last one is actually incredibly important for the whole of world history, and this is Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, a quick story about Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft was actually found in the bottom of a river, almost dead. There was this society that was trying to see the effects of drowning. Uh, of people. Obviously, you can't just go and throw people in a river because that's morally incorrect to do. So what they would do is that they would just go around into different bodies of water, whether it's the river, um, the River Thames that runs through, through, through London and England or any other body of water. And they would find people who had thrown themselves overboard and try to drown themselves and try to uh, resuscitate them and bring them back to life so that, they, that way they could see the effects of drowning. Well, Wollstonecraft was one of those. She attempted to kill herself by throwing herself in the river. Why would she do, do that? What compelled her to do so? Well, growing up, she saw her very drunk and abusive father beat her own mother time and time again. And Mary Wollstonecraft tried to protect her mother, but her father was significantly stronger than, than both of them. And so this started Mary Wollstonecraft down this path where she was very upset about a woman's place in society. And she said, well, look, you, we have all these enlightenment thinkers like Rousseau and Locke and Hobbes, and all of them are saying that people are born equal and that tabula rasa, if we just educate people, they will become better and that the people should be able to make decisions. But when these guys say the people, they don't mean women, they mean men. Even Rousseau, who believes in direct democracy, still stated that women should be educated in order to be useful to men. So Mary Wollstonecraft says, look, when women don't receive the same education as men, they're going to be slaves to men. And that's the term that she used. She said women are slaves to men because they... They haven't had an opportunity to educate themselves. And because they haven't educated themselves, they have to rely on men in order to make a living, in order to stay alive. And that is an unfair way to approach society. We should allow women to have the same rights as men. Women should be the ones who are being educated. Women should be able to vote and make decisions. Now, Mary Wollstonecraft is going to die in 1797, but her work, her effort is going to eventually inspire the women at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York. Now, it's this convention in which many of the greatest female thinkers all over the world come together and write something called the Declaration of Sentiments that we're actually going to look at in class during our synchronous learning session. This Declaration of Sentiments said that all men and women are created equal using the terminology from the Declaration of Independence. Our big thinkers were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, who were building on the ideas of Mary Wollstonecraft, that women need to be given education, that women need to be treated equally to men, that if men were going to say that all men are created equal, that women should be included in there as well. So overall, I know this is a lot of information, but overall, what you need to get from this is that all of these Enlightenment thinkers provide reasons and justifications for the political revolutions that we're going to see in subsequent lectures. These challenge the traditional power structures that were already in play. So those kings and queens that we looked at in Unit 3 who have all that power, that power is going to be challenged by regular, everyday, normal people. And gone are the monarchies and instituted are democracies 
and republics. We'll continue this discussion in our subsequent letter lectures. Our next lecture will be on the American Revolution.